Hello, and my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT professionals, IT students, and anyone who's interested in technical subjects. So in part two, we're gonna look at Windows 10 browsers. We're gonna look at Brave browser. We're gonna look at Firefox, Chrome. We're gonna look at the new Chromium Edge. And I'm also gonna take you back in time to Edge with the application guard. We're gonna look at all of those in relationship to how do they protect you in terms of privacy and security. We're gonna add the privacy Privacy Badger extension on all of those. And we're going to look at application firewalls and how they help you protect in privacy and security. I think you're going to be shocked at the winner. As we look at the nature and the behavior of browsers, we're going to use two tools and they're going to come from the Sysinternal Suite. Mark Rosinovich is the primary author of the Sysinternal Suite and they're just a wonderful uh, set of tools that allow us to look under the hood of Windows. They have the entire download for System Internal Suite, Nano server and amazing the arm 64 so this is very cool stuff we're going to be looking at we are primarily going to be using process explorer and tcp view let me slide this there's two versions this one here tcpcon.exe tcpvcon.exe is a command line version of tcp view tcpview.exe is the graphical I recommend both of these utilities that you right mouse click and you run them with administrative rights. So both of these utilities, is it's recommended that you run them with administrative rights. Now this is TCP view and this is Process Explorer. Process Explorer allows me to see processes. Processes are user mode modules of software, both services and other software that's running in the system. And it allows me to see what's really taking place in Windows. Now TCP view allows me to see those software processes that are talking to the network. If we look at the GUI interface, we see that we have a column for processes, and then we have a PID, process ID, and what protocol they're using, either TCP or UDP, and it also shows us, is it IP4 or IP6? It shows us the local address, the local port. So if it's a UDP, it tells us the port number. It also shows us the remote address and the remote port. So if it's, again, a UDP or TCP port, it will show us. Now under the column that says state, this has to do with TCP. When TCP is in the listening state, it is ready to make a connection. You'll see things like sync send, sync received, and once these states are met, you can establish a connection between two network devices or two software modules. We also have finish wait one, finish wait two, closing, close wait, last acknowledge, closed, time wait, and closing. These are all when I am terminating a connection between two software packages across the network. Many of these TCP states you won't see because they only last very briefly, so they'll never show up in the column. But you will see listening, established, closing, time wait. These will be some of the more common states of TCP in that column. And then last but not least are send packet, send bytes, receive packet, receive bytes. Let's understand how browsers and web servers work. We're going to use CNN.com. They offer very expensive content for free. And in order for them to do that, they have to generate a lot of revenue. So John goes to CNN.com. And he reaches out, pulls the web page from CNN.com, and it comes back to his browser. Now, the, what happens is that HTML code begins to, behind the scenes, connect him to all kinds of media servers, analytic servers, advertising servers, database servers, ad broker servers, and those are what help generate revenue for CNN.com. What he doesn't realize is he is being connected via CNN.com to this this huge host of un behind the scenes advertisers and other kinds of content providers that are help helping 
create revenue for CNN.com so he can visit the website, get his news, and be gone, and he hasn't paid a dime. So for me, a website having advertisement on the website is not a problem. They have to pay for the content that they're providing me. Otherwise, they have to charge me and it becomes a paywall on their website. So for most of most folks, it's not a problem of advertisers. It's when we get into marketers, people who want to take data. First of all, they've got to collect data. Then they begin to man- manage your personal data and then market to create more revenue streams. I think that's where we get into a problem. So here was a slide that I found on an online market website that takes and encourages people to market data from their website. It says when someone visits your website, they create as many as 40 data points. That's where we get into a problem. I went to another online marketer's website and here's what they think about your data. Rule number one, collect more to learn more. That kind of says it all. Make data collection simple, seamless, and strategic. And we'll see how they do that. Take your data collection and mobile. They want to get, and I've got a few, a, a list of the data that these marketers want to collect on you. I took it right off their website. I didn't create it myself. It's off their website. So here was another graphic I took off a marketing website and it just, it says it all from your PC to your phone. Here, give away all your data. I think this is where we get into a problem. So what are the unwanted data and traffic techniques that are being used by marketers on a lot of websites? And I'm here I've used www.somewebsite.com. So we have third-party cookies, retargeting pixels, user profile tags, click tracking, and email campaigns. And I saw on a marketing campaign website that they want to create a psychographic profile of each user so that it can be sold to market research. So that's where you need to be thinking about privacy. So we're going to begin with the Brave browser. I'm impressed with this browser. It seems to do a very nice job of blocking us from unwanted content, but allowing the content we do want to see on our browser. Let's look at our endpoints. Right now we have 49 endpoints, which is typical for Windows, just sitting here, doing not doing much. I've tried my best to keep the browsers at default settings. There's a lot of settings in there if you've been in any of these browsers. And so I've tried my best to try to keep this as, as fair as I I possibly can. So I'm going to launch Brave. And there it is. Let's go look at Process Explorer first. I'm going to, we can see we've got a parent process and we have, looks like six child processes down here. All of those processes do not talk to the network. We can see over here I've got network receive, network sent. And so it looks like this, oops, this child process talks to the network and this child process talks to the network. We can also look at, we can add up all of the private bytes and we can get an idea of page file size. We can add the working set and get an idea of RAM and then handles and then threads. And so it gives us an idea of the impact of Brave on our system. And we're really not doing anything. We're just going to a new tab, not doing much here at all. Now we're going to go ahead and go to CNN.com. And we're hoping that Brave will stop the connection, the endpoint connection to all of those behind the scene analytics, trackers, things that are a part of the CNN.com. And we're not picking on CNN. BBC.com, every news site, Wall Street Journal, they all do it. So it's not just CNN, but CNN does a great job of doing it. So it's a great place to go. All right, we're going to go there and we can see that we're only up to about 72 endpoints, which is pretty good. We're basically seeing most of the content on CNN, but it is definitely doing a good job of blocking us from unwanted material. So we went from 49 to 72. That's pretty good. Now let's look at Process Explorer. We can see we added a few additional child processes. So in order to connect to this very demanding website, we had to add quite a few additional child processes. So we've got two, four, six, eight, ten 10 additional child processes. 
Now, here's what we do want to do. That kind of gives you an idea of what it's doing dynamically as it connects to CNN.com. Now we're going to close the browser. So I'm going to close it. And what we want to do is we want to see all these connections quit. So I'm going to exit out. A lot of connections went away. Remember, we started with 49. We're at 60. These are what are known as persistent connections. You can see them right here. They're not going away, and they really should. So if we look at our state, it's time wait. So they're in the process of closing the connection, but something, and I'm assuming it's on the other side, it's not us, is delaying this. So we can see we have quite a few software packages that are holding persistent connections. A quick reflection on Brave. Brave allowed all the news content to be displayed and the advertising. We're not trying to avoid the advertising. That's how they pay for the content that they produce. Endpoints were between 10 and 15, and we don't know exactly what the endpoints are. We don't know if they're containers on AWS or Azure or just pro uh, who knows, they're on Google's cloud. They could be servers, whatever. We don't have an understanding of behind the scenes for CNN. With just 10, 15 connections, we were able to get all the news and advertising and everything seemed to work fine. Okay, now we're going to look at Firefox. I'm going to begin by launching Firefox. We're at 50 endpoints, by the way. And I'm going to say not now. And this is pretty standard, right out of the box. And we can see we went from 50 to about 73. And we really are not doing anything but just launching uh, an empty tab. I'm going to go to Process Explorer. And we can look at Firefox here. And here we see one parent process, three child processes. And here's what's interesting, is all of these processes talk to the network. That's pretty interesting. We can also add up all of the private bytes and the working set that gives us RAM. The handles are, remember, handles are registry, file folder, and graphical objects. Threads are modules of software within the process that are actually doing all the work. And we can look at the objects and memory and things of that nature that are impacting our Windows 10 machine. Now let's go back to our browser and type in cnn.com and we'll go ahead and go there so we can see we're at 137 you can see there's a lot of things that we could connect and Firefox we haven't tried to set up privacy settings or anything we've just out of the box Firefox download it run it and right now we're over 135 endpoints and if you Look here, you can see we're connected to a lot of stuff. Each one of these are different types of servers. This is an AWS bucket. Have no idea what it is. We can use this right mouse click who is. It gives us some information as to what it is. That's worth going in here and just do a who is on some of these sites. You'd be surprised. Looks like we've got some Google stuff. Now, let's go ahead and kill the browser and let's see what happens to all these endpoints. So I'm going to go ahead and kill that. You can see all the processes in Process Explorer go away and we're still at 116 endpoints. These are persistent connections that are just not giving up their hold. So let's reflect on Firefox. Firefox was out of the box. We didn't set a lot of privacy settings, just basically downloaded, installed it, and ran. Endpoints were between 61 and 66 on an average. I did a lot of stuff be that I didn't video. If 10 to 15 endpoints give you all the news and advertising, what's the purpose of 51 servers and services transferring data to your browser? Okay, we're ready to start Edge. And you can see I'm down to 49 endpoints. Let's get Process Explorer out. 
Let's go ahead and launch Edge. It just should open up a basic tab. Let's look at Edge. You can see it does a lot of the similar same things that we've seen before. A parent process, some child processes. Notice that not all the processes connect to the network. Looks like here with Edge, the parent process talks to the network and a couple child processes talk to the network. Generally, the way all browsers work is the parent is command and control. All activity in the child processes is controlled by the parent. So it's kind of like the command and control center for the browser. Let's go ahead and go to CNN.com. Right now we're at 78. And here we're jumping to 153 endpoints, 201. That gives you an idea of what is behind CNN.com. 240, ouch. So here it gives you kind of a picture, 245, of all the services, servers, 250. That is all behind CNN.com that wants to connect to your, your browser. All right, so let's go look at Edge. Notice, wow. A lot of additional child processes have been added in order to facilitate the connecting to all these resources on CNN.com. It did a good job of connecting us to every single thing on the planet. All right, we're going to go ahead and exit out of the browser and see how it, so we exit Edge. You can see it terminating Edge as a process. Now in terms of endpoints. The yellow means it's transitioning from one state to the other. We talked about those TCP states. And the red, it's closing. So we're 249 after we close the browser. So let's reflect the new edge. Remember, this is based on Chromium. Uh, we were able to see all the news content and all the advertising. The endpoints were about 167 on average. So if 10, 15 endpoints give you all the news and advertising, what's the purpose of 152 servers and services transferring data to your browser? Okay, we're ready for Chrome, and our endpoints are 51, and let's go ahead and launch Chrome. And let's look at, in Process Explorer, we see a parent process. We see, it looks like six, two, four, six processes, child processes that are running in Chrome. We see two of them are connected to the network. And right now we have from 50 to 66 just running, which is good. Let's go to CNN. And we're jumping to 124, 155. It takes it a while for it to connect to all these resources, 218. You can see on this page, there's a lot of resources to connect to. And we don't really understand everything that's going on. It's not like news organizations tell you what's going on. But we're obviously connecting to a lot of things, 280, a lot of stuff. And right now, we're not, we haven't asked these browsers, except Brave is kind of out of the box restricting some of this stuff. We haven't asked the browsers to restrict. So here, 306. So it kind of gives you an idea of what is going on behind organizations like CNN. And, and it's not just CNN, it's all of them. They all do this. Any, any website that has valuable information that is to giving it to you for free has to generate revenue and they all do this type of thing let's take a look at chrome chrome allowed all the news content and all the advertising to display endpoints were between or at about 240 endpoints so if 10 15 endpoints give you all the news and advertise me what's the purpose of 225 servers or in services transferring data to your browser. There's a lot of responsibility that's laying at the feet of Google. They really need to address this issue. There's pressure for them to do so. We'll see. So I've tightened down security a little bit in the, the Brave browser and I've added the Privacy Badger extension. This is a really good extension for all your browsers. And I'll go ahead and it's, it, it's running right now. Let's go ahead and make sure I pin it up there. I am going to, I've got 74 endpoints right now. Let's go to CNN.com. You can see right away 
Brave does a great job. 80 endpoints from 71 to 80. I've got Privacy Badger on and it does a pretty doggone good job of allowing me to get the content. You can see I'm getting most of the content on CNN. We're seeing all the advertisements, but it's trying to block us from all the other stuff that we don't need connected to. Okay, we have 57 endpoints. I've tightened up Firefox. I've added, ask it to have very strict privacy, and I've added Privacy Badger. So we're going to launch it, and we're at 86. Let's go ahead and go to CNN. Much better. We're seeing 136. This is much better than the original one. We still see we have access to most of the content. It's doing a much better job of not connecting us to everything behind the CNN system. 152. We still see a lot of the content for CNN.com, but we've definitely cut down on a lot of the stuff that was we were getting before. All right, let's take a look at Edge. So let's go ahead and I set up strict privacy and privacy badger. We're going to go ahead and launch it and we'll go to CNN.com. Much better. We're seeing 90, 92. Most of the content is visible. It's holding it at about 91, 92. Not bad. So Edge did a pretty good job overall. Not as good as Brave. Okay, we're at 55 endpoints. Let's launch Chrome. We've got high privacy settings and we've got Privacy Badger. Let's go to CNN.com, see how it does. 96, 103, 101. We're seeing most of the content on CNN.com and we're 100, 103. So to end our demonstration on browsers, I'm going to show you one last thing. This is my video server. It's got lots of software on it. You can see my endpoints are 158. But this copy of Windows has all the security components that really make a Windows 10 secure. If I go to Update and Security, let's go to Windows Security. I, I run Hyper-V. I'm getting core isolation, memory integrity. This is all leveraging Hyper-V to get me this type of security. If I go to browser, I'm using Microsoft's application guard, which gives me a, a virtualized Microsoft Edge browser. So I want to let you see the difference when you do have these components on Windows 10 and the impact they have on privacy and security. So here I've launched my Edge browser, and I'm going to leverage a virtualized browser, a totally Hyper-V virtualized browser. So I'm going to go to my options here, launch a browser using Application Guard, and I'm going to go back to the other browser and close it. Just get rid of it. You can see right now I've got 210, 211 endpoints, and I've got my totally virtualized browser sitting before you. And now I'm going to go to CNN.com. And you can see I'm my endpoints are actually going down and I'm still having all the access to the CNN website with less endpoints than when I started. This is totally virtualized. In other words, it's allowing me to go to CNN site, connect to all the resources. It protects it from my operating system. It really doesn't touch my operating system at all. With a virtualized edge, we were allowed to see all the news and content and all the advertising displayed fine. Our endpoints were actually only two. Higher cost in terms of page file and RAM because we're also supporting the application guard services. Great isolation built into the operating system, patched and maintained by Microsoft. A great thing to consider as you're looking at improving your privacy. Here's the actual screenshot of the services or endpoints for application 
avant-garde edge. Although it's got a lot of UDP, UDP version 6, you can see there's nothing connected, nothing established. There's only two endpoints connected while we connected to CNN.com. And here's a summary of everything we did. Though it's not totally scientific, there was an effort to be as accurate as possible. You can look at your page files for each of the browsers, including Edge. You can see that you have to add the application guard services. So you do take a hit here because you're adding, you're running additional services to get the virtualization. You can see RAM sizes, endpoints with default settings, endpoints with privacy enabled and privacy badger extension. Coming up, we're going to look at application firewalls and, and application tools to improve your privacy with your applications.